I, I need to begin just by apologizing for uh, being um, just wore out, honestly. I uh, didn't sleep well last night. Aaron's out of town with soccer. Um, and uh, so I, I got up, had some difficulties with getting ready in the morning. And anyway, um, went to the coffee shop. I was too lazy to make coffee. And I went to the coffee shop and ordered. I just said, just give me a coffee. And she said, how do you take your coffee? And I said, very, very seriously. Good morning. Welcome. Of course, that didn't happen to me. I did make my own coffee today. Uh, Aaron is out of town, but I wanted to uh, set that one up like I did last week uh, with a little bit of joke telling. We're going to celebrate Holy Humor Sunday. It was kind of a request from a parishioner of mine from my past. Uh, I used to do Holy Humor every uh, Sunday after Easter which is not a new tradition at all. It's uh, something that's been going on uh, for, for many people for quite some time to celebrate holy humor. And I'll talk a little bit about the theology, if you will, of why we need to be a little bit lighter in our lives. But uh, for now, just know that I do take my coffee very seriously and uh, I take worship very seriously. Sometimes I... Uh, take theology too seriously. And I'll talk a little bit about that later too. But for now, I hope you just settle in, get a smile on your face and appreciate that we don't need to take ourselves too seriously. Let's let God be God and know that we need to just be humble and appreciate the life we have been given. Amen. Will you join me in this call to worship? The words will be printed at the bottom of the screen for you. Sing a new song, a joyful melody of springtime, glory and rebirth. Sing praise to our still laughing Easter God who has rolled away the bindings of yesterday. Immerse your anxiety and despair in the fountain of a new earth. We place our visions and hopes on the table of wine and wheat. For God has taken ordinary things and made them extraordinary. Sing a new song. Amen. Lord of the Dance on page 261. And they stripped and they hung behind They left me 
The scripture for this week comes from John's gospel, his resurrection appearance story right after John's uh, resurrection story. Of course, last week we focused on Mark's gospel, but listen for God's word as it speaks to you from John's gospel in the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As God has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I said earlier, I sometimes take myself too seriously. I take my profession very seriously. And I know that many people take their faith very seriously, but sometimes, sometimes we need to consider actually Many times, we need to consider how we lighten up. I pondered something this week that really lightened me up. We are suspended on a ball hanging in the atmosphere, <laughs> in space. And it's spinning at an astronomical rate that keeps us grounded. Isn't that crazy? 
Jesus lived over 2,000 years ago. And here we are, stressed and worried, full of anxiety about our life of 80, 90, 100 years, we hope. That's perspective for me. And so I want to share with you some other perspectives about the theology of the spirituality of humor by other people. First, I want to share with you some tidbits. And if you look up spirituality and humor, this gentleman will come up often. He's a Catholic priest by the name of James Martin. And he writes, well, actually, this was in a speech. I'm reading it. He said, have you ever been to a mass, a worship service, where the priest says in a very dry, boring voice, and so we join with choirs of angels in their unending hymn of praise, holy, holy, holy Lord. And when you hear that, you think, if that's the way choirs of angels are singing their praise, we are in big trouble. He talks about how often our seriousness of religion is about how we perceive who Jesus is. There are many, many pieces of art that show Jesus very seriously. But this one, this one's my favorite. It's entitled Jesus Laughing. Many of you who attend our congregation have seen this. It often hangs in my office, but I try to keep it in the sanctuary. But this reminds me of who Jesus could have been, should have been, and probably was. Gosh, the joy, right? The joy, the joy of knowing God loves me. The joy of knowing peace be with you. Yeah. Does that look like a peaceful man? Yes, it does. And it reminds me of that. James Martin says, if you're not finding joy in your faith, there's something wrong with the way you are looking at your faith. And humor keeps us human. Let me say that again. Humor keeps us human. Basically, brings us down to earth, he says, and reminds us that we're not God. I love humor. I've always loved humor. As I said last week in my Easter sermon, I've always loved stand-up comedy. There's something about it that keeps me grounded. James Martin goes on to talk about the humor of the Pope John XXIII, who was Pope from 1958 to 1963, so not real long, and maybe because those who took the religion too seriously, maybe didn't like him too much. I don't know. But his most famous joke, Pope John the 23rd, came when a journalist innocently asked him, Your Holiness, how many people work in the Vatican? And he replied, uh, About half of them? Pope Francis, in a 2016 interview, commented about humor and religion by saying, a sense of humor gives you relief. It helps you see what is temporary in life and take things with a spirit of a soul 
who has been redeemed. It's a human attitude, but it is very close to the grace of God. Humor is very close to the grace of God. This is not far off the mark from a very famous theologian by the name of Karl Barth, who says laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God. He says in another place, humor is the opposite of all self-admiration and self-praise. That's where I know my fault comes in. Taking myself too seriously is my ego getting in the way of experiencing life, the joy of life. I want to be the best. I want to do the right thing every time. And sometimes I don't. And when I don't, I am so hard on myself. I am. I'm hard on myself when I don't do the right thing. There was another tidbit that I gleaned this week. Talks about how Humor can help us forgive ourselves and forgive others. It says, actually, let me share where it comes from first. Susan Sparks from her book, Laugh Your Way to Grace, Reclaiming the Spiritual Power of Humor. She says there's something fundamentally holy about it. She's referring to laughter, humor. She says, if you can laugh at yourself, you can forgive yourself. If you can forgive yourself, you can forgive others too. It's so true. Some of the most funny comedians that I have witnessed in this world were hard on themselves. And I think humor was a way for them to cope, a way for them to have an outlet of forgiveness. It's so true. We don't have to take ourselves so seriously all the time. Can we move forward together in lightheartedness, but at the same time, I'm not going to back down on justice issues. They're tied in with that very thing. Because honestly, I believe that those who are against certain groups of people, whoever they may be, are taking themselves too seriously. Maybe they need to lighten up. Hear a joke. Watch a funny movie. Take a step back and appreciate life. It's a good life we've been given. From another blog site by Jim Tolles, his blog site is entitled Spiritual Awakening Process. He says, seriousness is often an ego game where your ego is trying to get respect and living in a little tiny box that can't even contain a fraction of your fullness. In those regards, many people will find their way to awakening through humor because the seriousness of life will have finished teaching them all it can. There will be nothing left to be serious about. You'll start to realize it's all a big joke. That's what I was trying to say last week in my Easter sermon. God will always have the last laugh. You've heard the one that says, if you want to make God laugh, make plans. We're doing it all the time. And God has this unexpected way of breaking in and showing us the fullness of life. 
Jim Tolles goes on to say, laughter and humor is a tool like meditation. So consider that. This is a spiritual practice, and I'm big on spiritual practices. Laughter and humor is a tool like meditation, journaling, and everything else. He writes, there are times to use it, and there are times to not use it. But start with yourself. Look at all the things you worry about and laugh. And laugh some more. And keep laughing until you can see them again from a different angle. You may be surprised at what they look like when you no longer take it all quite so seriously. I've said this before. My greatest fear, deep down, deep down, my greatest fear is being alone. Being utterly alone. And when I think about that, when I think about that fear, that worry, that anxiety, I have to laugh. Because I have such a loving family. I have a great congregation that I'm a part of. I have a network of friends that expands global. Why am I stressing about being alone? And that's what drives my seriousness. I hope you will consider lightening up, not taking yourself so seriously, at least when you don't have to. I really do, because by the grace of God, by the grace of God, by the grace and humor of God, God will break in and show you who's in control and love on you every step of the way. Thanks be to God. Let's take a little humor break to end this with a joke. Once there was a guy named Bill who wanted a horse. On Craigslist, Bill saw a Christian horse, so he went to check it out. When Bill got to the ranch, the horse's owner said, it's easy to ride him. Just say, praise the Lord to make him go and amen to make him stop. So Bill climbed on the horse and he said, praise the Lord. And the horse started to walk. So he said, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And the horse started to run. And the horse was cruising. And Bill looked ahead and saw a cliff coming. And he said, amen, amen. And the horse stopped five feet in front of this cliff. And Bill's heart was racing. And he says, phew, praise the Lord. I've been watching the Masters this week. I'm a golfer, if you can call me that. I'm horrible, but I wanted to find a golf jewel. So here's this one. An avid golfer goes to see a fortune teller to inquire if there are any golf courses in heaven. She says, I have good news and I have bad news. And the golfer says, what's the good news? She says, the good news, sir, is that the courses in heaven are spectacular, just like Torrey Pines at the Masters. Without a doubt, better than anything you have ever seen on earth, in fact. Well, what's the bad news? Well, she says, you have a tea time at 8.30 tomorrow morning. A husband and a wife were going through a rocky phase and were giving each other the silent treatment 
I've done that. Have you? One day, in the height of hostilities, the husband realized that he needed his wife to wake him at 5 a.m. so that he could catch an early morning business flight. Not wanting to be the first to break the si silence, stubbornness, that's me. He wrote on a piece of paper, please wake me at 5 a.m. The next morning, he woke to discover that it was 9 a.m. and that he had missed his flight. Furious, he was about to confront his wife when he noticed a piece of paper on his pillow. The paper read, it's 5 a.m., wake up. May the peace of God, the grace of God, and the humor of God be with you. Amen. Gather those elements, whether it be a sliced bread or water or whatever it might be that suits you. Pause, gather those, and come to the table. I'm in my home, as you are yours. I have my cup and my bread on 
simple dishes. It doesn't matter. Again, we're not taking ourselves too seriously. But this sacrament is important to us. It reminds us that around the table, we share our lives, we share our stories, we share jokes. And so let us move into communion right now. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks to God for it and he broke it. And he said, take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and he said, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so we come to this table and all are welcome at this table. This is not my table. It's not your table, it's God's table. All are welcome at this table to come and take him who Jesus the Christ really was. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Foolish, foolish God, your belly laugh echoes through the world. We have responded to your invitation to join in the banquet. Here we have eaten, we have drunk, we have tasted your goodness. May the joy we find in this meal together lift up our hearts. May we carry your laughter to the world around us. May we live out that foolishness called love wherever we go. Amen. And on that note, I want to move into a little bit of a laughter break. I'm going to start by sharing one of my hats that I have in my office. Sorry. My jester hat. And I thought this joke would be appropriate after communion. A preacher was completing a sermon on temperance, basically anti-drinking. With great expression, he said, if I had all the beer in the world, I would throw it into the river. With even greater emphasis, he said, if I had all the wine in the world, I would take it down and throw it in the river. He said, even with more exuberance and fiery Preaching, he said, if I had all the whiskey in the world, I would take it down and throw it in the river. And he ended his sermon with that, and he sat down and said, Amen. The song leader then stood very cautiously and announced with a smile, For our closing hymn, let us sing hymn 365. Shall we gather at the river? That would be my wife's humor if she were here with us. On that note, I'm going to move into uh, a, a relationship joke, actually. Uh, there are lots of relationship jokes. Many of them are jokes that uh, probably will get people in trouble, honestly. <laughs> uh, this one's uh, not that kind of joke, though. A Minnesota couple decided to vacation to Florida during the winter. They planned to stay at the very same hotel 
where they spent their honeymoon 20 years earlier. Because of hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate their travel schedules. So the husband left Minnesota and flew to Florida on Thursday. His wife would fly down the following day. The husband checked into the hotel. There was a computer in his room. So he decided to send an email to his wife. However, he accidentally left one letter out in her email address and without realizing his error, he sent the email. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a minister of many years who was called home to glory following a sudden heart attack. The widow decided to check her email, expecting messages from relatives and friends. After reading the first message, she fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen which read, To my loving wife. The subject line said, I've arrived. I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. I've just arrived and have been checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is not as uneventful as mine was. P.S. It sure is hot down here. I'm going to end with a joke that is one of my favorites. I'm pretty sure you may have heard it. I tell it a lot because it's a joke that I can just tell and not read. I'm going to take the hat off for this one. When you're a pastor, particularly in a place like Montana, and you're appointed somewhere in rural Montana, you try to find people that you can connect with. And most often it's other clergy people. And I, as a Methodist pastor, in my first appointment connected with the Lutheran pastor and the Catholic priest. And it was an August day. It was really hot. We didn't have air conditioning in our house and we, we you always tried to find ways to just get away from the heat and i connected with the the lutheran pastor and the catholic priest and we decided to head out to the local park which had a pond and we were going to jump in the pond and it was so hot that we didn't really think that too many people would be out that way and so we jumped in the car and we headed out. And once we get out there, we're kind of soaking our feet and we decide, let's just jump in. But we didn't bring bathing suits. So we decided to just go buck naked. What the heck, right? So we strip off our clothes and we just jump in and we were cooling off and it feels so good. No one else was there. No one else was there at all. But then all of a sudden, there's this string of cars that's come rolling in. And we were like, oh my gosh, it's the community ladies day picnic. What are we gonna do? So we're hiding behind some reeds a little bit. Our clothes are way up on the bank. What are we gonna do? Well, we have to run for it. We, we just have to. So, we decide, okay, rock, paper, scissors, who's going first? So rock, paper, scissors, and the, the Lutheran pastor goes first. It's okay. 
Ready? Talk them up. One, two, three. And he goes running like this, covering himself all the way to the car and he jumps in the car and he gets in. Okay, no one seemed to notice. We're good there. Rock, paper, scissors, who goes next? So the Catholic priest goes first before me. All right, so I jazz him up. One, two, three. And he goes running and covering himself all the way to the car and he jumps in the car. Whew. So I'm by myself. Here I go. So I have to pump myself up. I'm ready to go. <sighs> Take some deep breaths. One, two, three. And I go running like this all the way to the car. And I jump in and we take off. Did anyone see us? I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. I think we're okay. They both turned back and said, why in the heck were you covering your face when you were running? And I said, I don't know about you two, but it's my face they're gonna recognize. Thanks be to God to be humorous people. By the grace of God, we have this life. Amen. Christ has risen Surprises bring smiles and joys to the everyday and the ordinary of our lives. May the God of love be seen in all we say and do. Go forth rejoicing, for the good work has just begun. Amen.